uh, Chair Terry. All set, we're going live. Yeah, sounds good. I'm just uh, getting the link to one more member, but for the most part, I think we're all here. Great, thank you. So good morning, everybody. This is State Senator Kathy Breen, Senate Chair of Appropriations. And we are joined today by our colleagues on the Committee on Taxation. And um, we are here today for a public hearing on the governor's proposed biennial budget, um, in particular, the parts of the budget that relate to taxes. And that's why we have the policy committee with us today. Um, just as a reminder um, for folks who are listening, um, this is broadcast live on YouTube. Um, and if um, so, if you come on to give testimony, your, your testimony will also be broadcast on YouTube and recorded. Um, so I think I'd like to start uh, with asking the um, Chair Terry to um, help with introductions of the tax committee and then we'll do appropriations. Sounds terrific. Thank you, Senator Breen. Um, and uh, uh, welcome everybody. Um, why don't we start with Representative Sachs? Good morning, everyone. My name is Melanie Sachs. I'm the representative for House District 48, which is Freeport and Park Townal. And Representative Hanley. Uh, good morning. I'm Jeff Hanley, District 87, which is Pittston, Alna, West Cassett, and Randolph. Representative Matlack. Good morning, I'm Ann Matlack. I represent House District 92, which includes the communities of Cushing, Thomaston, South Thomaston, St. George, the Tinicus Cree Haven and the Muscle Ridge Islands. Uh, Representative Carmichael. Good morning, I'm Mickey Carmichael. I represent House District 137, which is Hancock, uh, Penobscot and Washington counties, 18 communities and counties. Representative Kryzak. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. I'm Ted Kryzak. I represent District 20, Acton, Lebanon, and part of Shapley. And I am Representative Mo Terry. I represent District 26, which is the west side of Gorham, and I serve as House Chair on the Tax Committee. We are missing a few members today. We've got um, uh, Fridays or work days for most of us. So we'll, uh, we may see one or two pop their heads in. Um, in a bit. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure everybody got a chance to wave to Julie Jones, our analyst who is joining us today. Thank you very much, Representative Terry. Um, so um, I'm going to have the appropriations members introduce themselves. Um, why don't we um, start with Representative Fecto? Good morning, everyone. I'm Justin Fecto, and I represent House District 86, which are the western and northern portions of Augusta. Representative Fay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Jessica Fay. I represent House District 66, which is parts of the towns of Casco, Poland, and Raymond. Representative Corey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. I'm Patrick Corey, represent House District 25, which is part of Wyndham. Representative Cardone. Good morning. I'm Barbara Cardone. I represent House District 127, which is part of Bangor. Um, Representative Millett. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Soen Millett. I represent House District 71, the towns of Norway, Sweden, Waterford, and West Paris. Representative Hymanson. Good morning, I'm Patty Hymanson. I represent House District 4, which is parts of York, Wells, Sanford, and all of Ogunquit. Um, it looks like Representative Perry popped in from the Tax Committee. Would you like to introduce yourself, Representative Perry? Yes, good, good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Joe Perry, I represent- You represent part a district- of Bangor and part of Orno in the main house, District 124. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I have not seen Representative Arada, is that correct? I don't see her on here. Um, how about Representative Cloutier? 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, friends. I am Kristen Cloutier. I represent House District 60, which is part of Lewiston. Representative Martin? Um, you're on mute. So you have to, un John, you have to unmute yourself? Yeah. Okay. Oh, there you, you go. Now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. John Martin, House District 151 from Allagash to Fort Kent down Route 11 through the towns of Wallagrass, Eagle Lake, Winterville, Portage, Ashland, and down to the, and almost to the uh, Penobscot border. Um, Representative Hymanson, did I call you yet? Oh, I did, thank you. Um, how about uh, Senator um, Davis? Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Paul Davis and I represent Senate District 4, which is all of Piscataquis County and parts of Somerset and Penobscot. Thank you, Senator Thank Bailey. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Donna Bailey and I proudly represent Senate District 31, serving the residents of Saco, Old Orchard Beach, Hollis, Lemington, and part of Buxton. Thank you. Representative Corey, did, did I call on you yet? I did, thank you, okay. Um, and my co-chair, Representative Purse. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Teresa Purse, the House Chair of AFA. I represent District 44, which is the majority of Falmouth. And again, I'm State Senator Kathy Breen. I represent six and a half communities in Cumberland County, and I serve as Senate Chair of Appropriations. So um, we are going to, uh, uh, we also have our analyst on with us today, Maureen Dawson, and our clerk extraordinaire, um, Mandy Shorey. And uh, we're very grateful to the staff in the, in the State House who are working diligently and safely and helping us do our work online. And uh, we wouldn't be able to proceed without them. So big thanks to them. Um, they've all had a big week of public hearings this week. So thank you to everybody. Um, so we are about to start. We will have, um, I believe, Commissioner Figueroa. There she is. Oh, with a nice blue background. Woohoo! Very nice. Um, before we begin, I, I'll just say we're just going to basically hear from the commissioner um, and then we will take questions from the two committees and then we will do public testimony. Um, let me see how many folks, if we have any for, we have three people so far for public testimony. So before we uh, turn it over to Commissioner Figueroa, are there any questions from any of the committees about how we're gonna proceed today? Anything I've overlooked? Okay, um, we have found that using the raised hand function is very helpful if something does come up um, and you need my attention for some reason. Um, if that doesn't work, feel free to just shout out Madam Chair and um, my co-chair and I will be um, try to be as diligent as possible if anybody needs our attention. So um, with that, I will say good morning uh, to Commissioner Figueroa, the DAS Commissioner, um, and welcome back. And um, the floor is yours. Good morning, thank you. Um, so I'm realizing that I start off by saying that I will be doing the testimony for DAFs uh, the property tax review board and the items under the office of state treasurer. So, uh, which I'm realizing now is your entire agenda. So here I am. <laughs> so you get the whole day. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, um, so good morning, Senator Breen, Representative Purse and members of the joint standing committee on appropriations and financial affairs. Senator Chipman and Representative Terry and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Taxation. My name is Kirsten Figueroa and I am the Commissioner of the Department of Administrative and Financial Services. I am here today to testify in support of the fiscal year 22-23 biennial budget um, LD221, specifically those items on today's agenda relating to the State Board of Property Tax Review, the Department of Administrative and Financial Services, and the Office of the State Treasurer. As Governor Mills said, at a time when Maine people are hurting, 
when small businesses are struggling to keep their doors open, when the ranks of the unemployed have swelled, and when we are fighting a deadly, deadly virus all around us, we are proposing balanced budgets as required by the Constitution that continue efficiencies, good fiscal management, and curtailments to cover projected revenue shortfalls for all three fiscal years. They focus on combating the COVID-19 pandemic by continuing to rebuild the state's public health infrastructure and protecting essential health care, education, and life-saving services. They do not change main tax rates and they maintain the budget stabilization fund. With a future made unpredictable due to the ongoing pandemic, these budgets make good on the promise of government, which is to protect and support the well-being of our people and institutions. I start with the State Board of Property Tax Review, which is on page A436. The State Board of Property Tax Review hears and determines tax abatement appeals involving non-residential properties with an equalized valuation of $1 million or more, as well as appeals arising under the tree growth law the farm and open space law, the mine site law, and the working waterfront law. The board consists of 15 members appointed by the governor. The board receives advice and guidance from the office of the attorney general and is supported by one administrative assistant position shared with the main board of tax appeals. The baseline appropriation is approximately $86,000 in each year and there is an other special revenue fund allocation of $3,000 in each year. There are no new initiatives in this program. If it's good with you, I'm just going to keep going. Now we're on to the okay, now we're on to the Department of Administrative and Financial Services. The Department of Administrative and Financial Services, DAFs, consists of 10 bureaus, a handful of boards and commissions, and more than 1,200 employees serving the public and all three branches of state government. The department has a broad range of responsibilities. We serve as the principal fiscal advisor to Governor Mills, prepare the state budgets, coordinate the financial planning and programming activities of state agencies, prepare the financial records of the state, and advise the Maine legislature on the economic status of the state and financial statutes of state government. Additionally, DAFS oversees all aspects of human resources, including employee benefits, contract negotiations, recruiting, retaining, training, and performance, <clears throat> information technology services, including cybersecurity, data management, application development, project management, technology infrastructure, accessibility, and network services, maintenance, repairs, and capital improvements of state-owned buildings and grounds, leased space, procurement, contracting, and vendor management, state postal services, surplus property, tax collection, tax law, and tax policy, and fleet management. Various internal services for the state agencies are provided by the department including review of accounting transactions and procedures and the implementation of account controls. We also administer the state's lottery operations, medical and adult use marijuana programs, and the sale of distilled spirits within Maine's borders. Today's testimony relates to the tax-related initiatives as proposed in the biennial budget. Excuse me. We start on page A14. The Bureau of Revenue Services Fund. This is an internal service fund that contains the revenue and expenditures associated with scanning, imaging, and collections services performed by Maine Revenue Services on behalf of other Maine state agencies. The annual allocation in this program is $151,720. The expenditures within this program are supported entirely by the agencies for whom the work is performed. There are no new initiatives in this program. 
on page A16 is the county tax reimbursement program. Through this program, MRS collects motor vehicle and watercraft excise taxes from residents in the unorganized territory and redistributes the funds to the respective county governments to be used for services provided in the unorganized territory. The annual allocation for this other special revenue account is $1.44 million. There is one initiative in this program that proposes to increase the allocation by $560,000 per year for an anticipated increase in revenue collected from taxpayers in the unorganized territory for motor, ve motor vehicle and watercraft excise tax. On page A19 is the baseline budget of nearly $90 million annually for the Homestead Property Tax Exemption Reimbursement Program. The purpose of this program is to offset the effect on local property tax revenues arising from the municipal exemption of certain homestead property of qualified Maine residents. The reimbursements are mandated by Article 4, Part 3rd, Section 23 of the Maine Constitution. There is one initiative in the program for a $7.5 million appropriation in fiscal year 22 and an $8.2 million appropriation in fiscal year 23 to conform with Public Law 2019, Chapter 343, Part H, which increased the individual homestead exemption from $20,000 to $25,000 and increased the rate of reimbursement to municipalities from 62.5% to 70%. The main board of tax appeals is on page A23. This is an independent board within DAFs established July 1st, 2012 and not subject to the supervision of Maine Revenue Services. The board provides taxpayers with a fair system of resolving their controversies with MRS and ensures due process. The general fund baseline budget of approximately $380,000 in each year supports the efforts of the board, including two appeals officer positions and one part-time administrative assistant position. There is also an allocation for an other special revenue fund of $45,000 in each year. There is one initiative in this program reducing general fund all other appropriations by $20,000 in each fiscal year. During the department's review to identify savings for the FY21 curtailment, it was determined based on history of expenditures that this reduction could be an ongoing initiative. On page A24 is the business equipment tax exemption, BETI mandate reimbursement program. The purpose of this program is to reimburse municipalities for state mandated cost related to the implementation of BETI as required under Article 9, Section 21 of the Maine Constitution and Title 30A, Section 5685 of the Maine Revised Statutes. There is one initiative in this program that provides an appropriation of $1,403 per year to reflect the anticipated need resulting in a total appropriation of $20,500 per year. On page A29 is the Renewable Energy Facilities Property Tax Exemption Program. Public Law 2019, Chapter 440, enacted a property tax exemption for certain solar and wind energy equipment facilities in the form of personal property and real property. There are two initiatives in this new program. The first initiative provides an appropriation of 192,500 in fiscal year 22 and 1.7 million in fiscal year 23 to reimburse municipalities 50% of the property tax revenue loss as a result of this exemption. The reimbursements are main, mandated by article four, part third, section 23 of the Maine constitution. The second initiative provides an appropriation of 22,000 per year to reimburse municipalities for the mandated cost of complying 
with the Renewable Energy Facilities Property Tax Exemption Program as required under Article 9, Section 21 of the Maine Constitution and Title 30A, Section 5685 of the Maine Revised Statutes. On page A30 is the Maine Revenue Services Baseline Budget. It includes a general fund appropriation of 44.1 million in FY22 and 44.5 million in FY23 and other special revenue allocations of 11.5 million in each year. These funds provide for MRS to serve the citizens of Maine by administering the tax laws of the state effectively and professionally while simultaneously collecting the revenues necessary to support Maine government. MRS collects approximately $4 billion in annual revenue for the general fund and more than half a billion dollars in highway fund and other special revenue. There are two initiatives in this program. The first initiative eliminates the allocation for highway use tax evasion projects. This program was established to use allocated federal highway funds to carry out highway use tax evasion projects with the Internal Revenue Service. The program was last utilized in fiscal year 2016. The second initiative is a deappropriation of $1,714,411 in each year of the biennium. This represents one-time savings through reductions of approximately 424,000 in temporary staffing, $500,000 in professional services, and 791,000 in other technical staff. These costs were necessary to conduct due diligence in replacing MRS's antiquated and varied computer systems with a holistic, modern, commercial off-the-shelf program, STARS, which stands for State Tax Administration and Revenue System. The ongoing costs associated with this four-year project are now covered by a project certificate of participation. These funds will be restored in the next biennial budget to support the COP debt service payments that begin in fiscal year 24. On page A32 is the Snow Grooming Property Tax Exemption Program. The purpose of this program is to reimburse municipalities 50% of the property tax revenue loss as a result of the exemption for trail grooming equipment registered with the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. The reimbursements are mandated by Article 4, Part 3rd, Section 23 of the Maine Constitution. The snow grooming equipment is purchased by local snowmobile clubs and used to maintain Maine's snowmobile trail system. The one initiative in this program is a deappropriation of $3,120 per year based on the calculated amount needed for reimbursements, resulting in a total appropriation of $26,880 each year. On page A36 is the tree growth tax reimbursement program with a baseline budget of $7.6 million per year. The purpose of this program is to help moderate municipal property tax rates for municipalities that experience reduced valuations due to the mandated use of lower current use values in place of higher ad valorem values. The reduced valuation on forest land causes a general shift in local tax burden to non-classified property because the lower taxable valuation base produces a somewhat higher property tax rate. Unlike other property tax reimbursement programs, the tree growth tax reimbursement program is authorized by the constitution, but is not subject to the amendment mandated reimbursement by the state. The state reimburses municipalities for revenue loss associated with the program. For tax year 2019, there were approximately 3.6 million classified acres included in more than 24,000 parcels in municipalities statewide reimbursed through the program. Although not reimbursed through this program, there are an additional 7.5 million acres of classified forest land in the unorganized territory. There are no new initiatives in this program. 
On page A37 is the Unorganized Territory Education and Services Fund. This fund disperses tax revenue assessed on unorganized territory properties to the counties that provide services to the unorganized territory. The baseline allocation in this fund is $20.6 million each year. The Office of the State Auditor is the fiduciary of the fund. Main Revenue Services collects the revenue and makes the distributions on behalf of the State Auditor. There are no new initiatives in this program. On page A37 is the Veterans Tax Reimbursement Program. The purpose of this program is to diminish the effects on local property tax burdens arising from the municipal exemption provided for estates of qualified veterans and certain survivors of a deceased veteran who are eligible based on the qualifying service of that veteran. The program reimburses municipalities 50% of the loss in property tax revenue. The reimbursements are mandated by Article 4, Part 3rd, Section 23 of the Maine Constitution. There is one initiative in this program for an appropriation of $31,670 per year to accommodate anticipated reimbursements based on increasing mill rates bringing the total appropriation to $1.26 million in each year of the biennium. On page A38 is the Veterans Organization's Tax Reimbursement Program. The purpose of this program is to reimburse municipalities for 50% of the loss in property tax revenue associated with the property tax exemption granted to veterans organizations. The reimbursements are mandated by Article 4, Part 3rd, Section 23 of the Maine Constitution. The one initiative in this program is a deappropriation of $5,200 per year based on the calculated amount needed for reimbursements, resulting in a total appropriation of $44,800 each year. On page A38 is the Waste Facility Tax Reimbursement Program. The purpose of this program is to reimburse municipalities for 50% of the loss in property tax revenue as a result of the exemption provided to certain waste storage facilities. The reimbursements are mandated by Article 4, Part 3rd, Section 23 of the Maine Constitution. These facilities are constructed solely for the storage of manure and other wastes generated by animal production. Eligible facilities must have appropriate plans filed with the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. The one initiative in this program is a deappropriation of $1,268 based on the calculated amount needed for reimbursements, resulting in a total appropriation of $10,920 each year. That concludes the initiatives and now I have a couple of language pieces that I'd like to read for taxation. Part H is on page 13 of the language document. It modernizes, clarifies, and simplifies. Simplifies. That is a new word that I would like us to all use through the remainder of the biennial budget. It simplifies. Really, really noted. <laughs> It simplifies the service provider tax law regarding consumer purchases of digital media by equalizing the tax treatment between the various modes of purchase for sales occurring on or after October 1, 2021. More broadly, this part keeps main sales tax and service provider tax aligned with the technology advancements and consumption shifts in the audio, visual, and digital products industry. Maine has historically taxed traditional forms of audio, vid video, and digital media consumption, including cable and satellite television and radio, DVD sales and rentals, et cetera. Taxpayers have been increasingly accessing the same media content through online digital streaming services. This is an example of main tax law needing to be adjusted to keep up with changing technology. The table set out in my printed testimony prepared by Maine Revenue Services compares the various ways digital and audio content are consumed 
and the way they are currently taxed in Maine under the sales and service provider taxes. As you can see, Maine taxes the purchase and rental of video content in a variety of forms, but not in its latest iteration, digital streaming. Likewise, Maine taxes the purchase of audio content in a variety of forms and the, and the rental of in limited situations, but not in its latest iteration, digital streaming. In other words, the tax code is treating the new streaming platforms more favorably than similar older distribution models. Part H of this bill would align the taxation of these various forms of consumption of essentially the same content by taxing digital audio and video content, regardless of the method in which it is consumed by applying the service provider tax to the sale of digital audio visual and digital audio services. Part H applies to sales occurring on or after October 1st, 2021. Part R is on page 21 of the language document. Part R is standard language that recurs biennially and is submitted to recognize the various tax expenditures that are included in Maine law. Tax expenditures are defined in Title 36, Section 199-B of the Maine Revised Statutes as any provision of state law that results in the reduction of tax revenue due to the special exclusions, exemptions, deductions, credits, or preferential rates or deferral of tax liability. The Maine State Expenditure Report, which is prepared biennially, is available online. So that concludes the DAF's tax part. Um, and I'm happy to move on to the Office of State Treasurer. Okay, perfect. Uh, uh, sorry, Commissioner, are, are you doing the, I noticed that our Treasurer is on with us. You're gonna present? Correct. And he's available for questions? Correct. Wonderful. Um, so we do have a couple of questions from some committee members. So let's just pause for a second. Okay. Thank you. Um, it looks like um, Representative Terry Fecto and Cloutier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Commissioner, once again, for your incredible reading and um, new words. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just a quick question in regards to um, uh, section uh, part H. Um, can you clarify for me uh, on the audio content part uh, where it says satellite radio? And I know we're not supposed to mention names or brands or anything, but is that the same thing as um, XM or Sirius Radio, that kind of service? I would, if it's possible for... Um, John or Daniel to just pop on and nod. Is that the same, Mr. Sagasser? I'd like to introduce John Sagasser is from the um, Maine Revenue Services Office of Tax Policy. Are you able to um, confirm? I can say regardless of the company, the satellite services as a category is currently taxable. So the satellite services as an industry sector is included currently. And okay. it, would that include such company as like Sirius? <laughs> Without saying, I, so I can't address particular <laughs> companies. If a company is doing satellite radio, it's currently included. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank <That> you. <laughs> it's very delicate. Sorry thank for the you. trick question. <laughs> All set, Representative Terry? Great. Uh, Representative Fecto and then Cloutier. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, any idea how much uh, this tax increase is expected, uh, the state is expected to collect? Yes. I am looking at my text because I know that that answer is coming. 
Do you mind if we take the next question while that text yeah. flows through? Jenny, I'm looking at you. Yep. Okay. And, Thank um, you. and just for the reminder to the tax committee that um, what we don't get answered today, obviously we'll get, make available for work session. So Representative Cloutier. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Figueroa. Um, so two things, I originally had one, but now there's another. So I just wanna clarify that this isn't a tax increase. It's actually just an equity issue across the board. So we're just making sure that um, different services are being taxed equally because of the change in the way that it's being delivered. That's accurate. We like, we, we refer to it as modernizing, like we need to keep the tax code. We don't, tax horses and carriages the way that we used to because cars are now a thing, right? So same same right. digital streaming, correct. Thank you. And then secondly, on our um, schedule, we have a, a program under DAFs that's the elderly tax deferral program. And I couldn't find that in my book and I know you didn't reference it. So I'm just wondering what is up with that. Thank you. In the Spirit of delayed through technology, I will now answer the question of the revenues and then answer the question of the elderly tax referral program because it got it, it got eliminated as a program and I know that my little texter is going to tell me with what. Um, the revenue expectation for Part H is $3.8 million in FY22 and $6 million in FY23. And? I wonder if it got folded into the property tax fairness credit. Is what my recollection is. And so I, I will um, just ask to confirm that. And it's possible that someone from main revenue services can do that a little bit quicker, but um, I will confirm it was removed last year um, but I will get the answer. For Thank that. you very much. Thank you. Any other uh, questions before we move on? Uh, Representative Millett. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, Commissioner. Um, just a quick response on the county tax reimbursement growth in the initiative, uh, an increase of 560000 per year for anticipated increased revenues from motor vehicle and watercraft excise taxes. It seemed like a fairly large growth on a basis of a $1.4 million starting point. What's happening in the unorganized territories that you're aware of that justifies that level of increase? This is actually one of those situations where we should have caught the allocation up over several years, it's so we, we have been doing it through financial order, and so we're just a, adjusting it. It's not a one. It's not a one-year shift. It's kind of been growing, and um, we've been doing financial orders. So we're just adding the allocation. Um, Thank you. It helps. Yep. Representative Hanley. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner. I have a question about uh, a twenty-nine which is the energy reimbursement uh, tax exemption. In view of some of the inf uh, information we received lately about the massive investment in solar, is this, are these projections a little bit low for the future? Or do you have any projections for the future? I would love to get that answer to you for work session because I think when we do um, fiscal notes, we do go out at least to 24 and 25. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but I will say that um, there's been a lot of work on this. So if you don't mind, I will bring that to the work session. That would be great. Thank you. Can I also say that the elderly um, tax program was an was open application until 3-31-1991. There were 150 people on the program and regretfully they have all since passed away. And so the program was then uh, closed. But certainly low income seniors have access to other forms of property tax relief. Oh yes, that's 
homestead exemption, property tax fairness credit, things like that. Um, okay, so um, any other questions with re respect to this tax section? Okay, uh, so commissioner, if you'd like to move on to the office of the treasurer, that would be great. And I think um, a couple, but I'm sorry to interrupt, but a couple of new, a couple of additional members have joined, uh, joined us. I think I saw Senator Pouliot. Um, if you're a legislator who hasn't had the chance to introduce yourself, um, please just raise your, do your raised hand. And I see Rep. Senator Pouliot, go ahead. But if there's anyone else, please do your raised hand. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Great to see you all. State Senator Matt Pouliot represents Senate District 15, the towns of Augusta, China, Oakland, Sydney, and Vassar. Welcome. Um, okay, don't see any raised hands. So, um, Commissioner Figueroa, you're got it. Thank you. Um, now, for the items that are under the Office of the Treasurer of the State that relate to tax items. The Municipal Revenue Sharing Program, which exists to stabilize the municipal property tax burden and to aid in financing municipal services, is divided into two programs, the State Municipal Revenue Sharing, number one program, and the Disproportionate Tax Burden, number two, pro two fund. The Office of the Treasurer of the State processes both revenue sharing one and two payments. The monthly revenue sharing pool is funded by a transfer of a percentage of sales, service provider, personal and corporate income tax receipts. Municipalities receive funds according to a set formula that relies on state valuation, tax assessment and population. The disproportionate tax burden fund, more commonly known as revenue sharing two, can be found on page A484 of the budget document. There is one initiative in this program to maintain revenue sharing at 3.75% and adjust for forecasted revenues. The initiative in this program will be adjusted in a biennial budget change package to reflect the December 2020 revenue forecast, as well as the impact of tax conformity changes, including the governor's updated Paycheck Protection Program proposal. The corrected allocation adjustment amount is $5,378,618 in FY22 and $6,755,218 in fiscal year 23. This will result in a total allocation of 31 million $797,157 in fiscal year 22 and $33,173,757 in fiscal year 23. And sorry, uh, Commissioner Figaro, that's at the 3.78 revenue sharing rate. 3.75, yeah. So yeah, thank you. The state municipal revenue sharing program, known as Revenue Sharing 1, is on page A486. The baseline budget of $117,706,329 represents the budgetary authorization for revenue sharing at 3.75%, as estimated for fiscal year 2021. There is one initiative in this program to maintain revenue sharing at 3.75% and adjust for forecasted revenues and step tax changes through the biennium. As with the disproportionate tax burden fund, the amount in this initiative will be updated by a budget, biennial budget change package to reflect a reduction of $6,359,739 in fiscal year 22 and a reduction of $1,011,300 in fiscal year 23. This will result in a total allocation of $111,346,590 in FY22 
and $116,695,029 in fiscal year 23. The total allocation for municipal revenue sharing, the combination of these two accounts, will be approximately $143.1 million in fiscal year 22 and $149.9 million in fiscal year 23. After the governor's fiscal year 21 change packages, the fiscal year 21 allocation will be $134.6 million. Actual expenditures for municipal revenue sharing were $113.6 million in FY20 and $74.1 million in FY19. On page A485 is the Passamaquoddy Sales Tax Fund. This fund is established as an other special revenue account to be administered by the treasurer of the state for the purpose of returning sales tax revenue to the Passamaquoddy tribe as required by Title 36, Chapter 213, Section 1815 of Maine Revised Statutes. The Property Tax Relief Fund for Maine residents on page A485 includes a baseline allocation of $206,500. This program was created through Public Law 2019, Chapter 448, an act to return funds to Maine property taxpayers. The allocation was intended to fund expenses necessary to provide property tax relief payments of at least $100 to property taxpayers when such an amount accumulated in this fund. The property tax relief fund for Maine residents was the source for the $104 checks provided to Maine property taxpayers pursuant to the law I just referenced. Between January and April of 2020, 309,851 checks totaling $32,224,504 were delivered to Maine property taxpayers, basically zeroing out the account. Any outstanding expenses should be finalized this fiscal year. That concludes initiatives and now I move to the language. Part F is on page 11 of the language document. Section F1 repeals the property tax relief fund for Maine residents as established in Title V, Section 1518-A. And based on this repeal, Section F-2 realigns the distribution of excess general fund revenues with 90% going to the budget stabilization fund and 10% going to the capital construction and improvements reserve fund. Public Law 2015, Chapter 267, Part L-8, amended the statute that prioritized year-end transfers, otherwise known as the Cascade, by eliminating the transfer to the Capital Construction and Improvements Reserve Fund. Prior to this elimination, at the close of each fiscal year following certain other transfers, 10% of the remaining excess revenues were transferred to the Capital Construction and Improvements Reserve Fund to support necessary projects and improvements related to state-owned properties. It looks like there was an intention to replace this cascade elimination with an ongoing appropriation. And indeed, $3 million was included in both fiscal year 2016 and 2017. However, this level of funding was not appropriated beyond fiscal year 17. For the current biennial budget, there was just the baseline appropriation of $310,587. In the supplemental budget proposed last year, we asked for $3 million in both fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21. We received an additional one-time $2 million in fiscal year 20. The $3 million request for FY21 didn't make it into the emergency change package or the bill that passed last March. Also, there's an other special revenue account for proceeds from the sale of state buildings and property, which has been spent down to nearly zero as a result of not having that appropriation in fiscal year 21. 
although this fund is meant to support is used is meant to be used to support maintenance deposits are not consistent as sales of state property are infrequent and the funds are not nearly enough to cover even the basic of routine maintenance and repairs for the more than 2 million square feet of space let alone when we have an emergency or unplanned event such as a failed system or bu building envelope issue or the frozen pipe in the state office building last year that caused a flood and by the way, may have been caused by cold airflow from windows that are long overdue for replacement. As reported last year, while working through LD 1969, an act to protect state workers from exposure to carcinogens presented by Representative Harnett, some of the routine maintenance and upkeep of our state owned assets has been neglected. Additionally, general tracking of building owned or leased issues and concerns had been sporadic and somewhat haphazard. Over the last year, the Bureau of General Services has made a concerted effort to collect and catalog in a comprehensive file known data related to harmful contaminants contained in and around workspaces, both owned and leased, including asbestos, lead, PCB, and mold. This database includes any testing associated with the discovery or remediation, such as air and water testing including post clearance results. We also include the steps taken to remediate these items. This is an ongoing dynamic effort and file. We use and track this information to help ensure that facilities are safe, sanitary, and healthy for those who repair, maintain, work in, and visit them. DAFS is also contracted with a vendor to do a separate analysis and inventory of all state facilities to include catch up, keep up and build up maintenance and renovation information. That work and evaluation is ongoing. Repair and maintenance funds are needed for parking garage repairs, plumbing and electrical issues, roof replacements and repairs, mold, lead, asbestos and water testing, walkway repairs, septic system maintenance, building envelope repairs, drainage upgrades, paving improvements and striping, master plan update, masonry repointing, window replacements, space planning, mechanical system upgrades, painting, flooring, carpenting, lighting repairs and updates, retaining wall maintenance, remediation efforts, and capital asset management planning. The Department of Administrative and Financial Services has direct responsibility to ensure the safety and wellness of our state government employees and our visitors to um, our offices. Our Bureau of Human Resources statutory mission is to establish within state government a high concern for state employees as people. And our building and of general, our Bureau of General Services is tasked specifically with ensuring that facilities are safe, sanitary, and healthy for those who work and visit them. In the fiscal year 21 supplemental, we requested a one-time $2 million appropriation for this fund. In another section of the biennial, we ask for another one-time $2 million appropriation for fiscal 22. And then in fiscal 23, we propose through this part F cascade language to reestablish an ongoing consistent funding source to ensure the proper maintenance and upkeep of our state's capital assets and the protection of our state's human assets. Part G is on page 12 of the language document. This part maintains the transfer to the local government fund revenue sharing at 3.75% for both fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23. Thank you. This concludes my testimony. We're happy to take questions now and for the work session. And also as previously mentioned, I would like to introduce an offer that Henry Beck, the state treasurer is here for any questions you may have for the office of the treasurer of the state. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Commissioner Figueroa. Um, so, and welcome, um, Treasurer Beck. Are there um, any questions from either committee for the DAS Commissioner or the Office of the Treasurer? Uh, Representative Millett, I see your hand and others. If, uh, if you could use the raise hand function. Representative Purse, thank you. Representative Millett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick question to Commissioner Figueroa in alerting us to the likelihood of a change package on 
Rev 1 and Rev 2 coming uh, later in the year. I'm assuming, maybe just ask it as a confirmation that that change package would likely come after the April revenue forecast update and would include that kind of uh, projection of sales and income uh, tax data as well. That was our thought. Thank you. That we would wait. Um, the current numbers do not include December. So we need to update for that. But our thought was that we would wait and just do it with the with the May update as well. I think it, it would be timely uh, if it did come after the April report. So we'd deal with the entire picture. Thank you. Representative Purse and then Terry. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to ask for the work session. Uh, on page 11, you've made a very strong case for the fact that we've neglected many of our buildings across the state. These are assets that we own and we should be working a lot harder to keep them uh, up to snuff uh, and, uh, and it won't cost us as much in the long run if we tend to do it that way. But I'd love to have a copy of the BGS collecting and cataloging that they're doing. Is, is it online or something that you could provide a link where that is? And then I'm wondering too, um, you've contracted with a vendor to do a separate analysis. I'm wondering about the timing of that and when that's happening. Um, so thank you. Uh, Representative Terry. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I echo Representative Purse's um, concern about the buildings, um, as I've mentioned before. And um, on a personal note, having served on state and local last year and seeing um, uh, Representative Hartnett's bill uh, go by the wayside, I'm really grateful that you're continuing that work on keeping those buildings and the people that work in them very safe. Um, my question um, uh, actually perhaps is for the treasurer and maybe we can wait till the work session for it, but um, uh, treasurer Beck, I wonder if you can tell us how long um, it took to uh, fill that um, uh, the property tax, um, uh, the property tax uh, fund to get to 32 million um, and um, how it, how it was, um, how it was filled prior to the 2019 law. And if uh, we put in uh, $200,000 every year, if that's gonna, um, if it will be multiple generations before we see it reach 32 million again. Sure, so that important to keep in mind that the property tax relief fund for Maine residents essentially replaced the income tax relief fund for Maine residents. And it took, from what I recall, um, about uh, seven or eight calendar years to trigger, and to trigger the $100 per household amount. Um, but at the same time, we, I think we were coming up close on the income tax rate reduction trigger as well. So and it, that was, it's been funded by a split in the cascade over time. And I, I recall the original program took about seven or eight calendar years, but we'll try to get you some more specific information. It, has to, it depends on, on you know, revenue performance and surplus performance. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah, we do have that. And, and uh, Treasurer Beck is spot on with seven years. Um, and we do have that uh, detail that we can share. Any other questions for um, the commissioner or the treasurer? Representative Corey. I'm so bad at that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a question. So we were talking about sort of the maintenance of our buildings and everything. I understand how important it is to maintain those. Um, like many sort of like employers across the state right now with COVID, I imagine that a certain percentage of our workforce is working remotely. So I'd be really curious to know how much of our workforce is working remotely, not actually utilizing um, any of the state's square footage and building space right now. Um, and with that, you know, um, will any of these people continue to work from home post pandemic? And are we looking at how, how you know, this last year has changed 
um, how we're going to be utilizing state office space in the future. Thank you. I love this question and I am ready. So um, first of all, primarily the 2 million square feet of space that we talk about is in the Augusta Capitol complex. Um, and, you know, whatever we decide to do with the buildings, they're historic buildings. So, um, but what I would say is one of the things that we have learned, and I'm gonna just um, dovetail into Representative Purse's question for a second, because we, the contract that we had with the vendor is actually uh, in progress and they've actually done their first report to us. It's just very new. And I'm really hopeful that by the work session, we'll even be able to tell you a little bit um, about besides telling you that Maine's office buildings are the oldest buildings in the state. Um, but what we have learned is that our buildings were actually overpopulated to begin with. We had too many office workers in the space. So some of what's going to happen, and you are right to bring up teleworking, it's here now. Um, some of you who have been around will know that state government has been tasked for at least 10 years with doing a telework study and was not able to complete it. And then we transitioned um, nearly 70% of our non 24 seven public safety personnel to telework within six weeks of the pandemic, which was uh, incredible. State government never shut down. We continued our services some piece of that is no doubt in our future um, uh, and will be continued. Uh, but the right sizing of the buildings, at least um, preliminarily based on what we've discussed, um, wouldn't have us getting rid of any of our buildings. It would just have us right sizing them and using them better. And I can have much more information on, on this. And of course, we have a, another conversation about it at state and local government when we ask for the $2 million appropriation as well. Just real quick, like a, a byproduct of that sort of discussion is just how much, how much of our office space is owned right now by us versus how much of it's leased? I know that, you know, going through appropriations budgets and the past we talked about increases in leases and and everything else and certainly that's going to factor in on this and I don't expect you to have that answer today but I'm just curious yep absolutely because that's definitely one of the considerations our inland fish and wildlife building is actually a leased space and um, this the consideration is is there a way for us to uh, consolidate that staff into some of the existing office space that the state owns. So those are the conversations that um, our director uh, of BGS is having um, all the time. So we'll, we'll come to work session with that and get you that information. Thank you very much. Any other uh, questions before we move on to um, public testimony from the committees? Okay, um, I'm going to rely on um, some help from our clerk. It looks like, oh, we've got some former legislators, a current legislator. Um, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six folks um, signed in to um, testify. And um, the first one I'm going to move on to the panel is none other than Sanford Mayor Anne Marie Mastracchio. So hopefully she will be appearing shortly. Madam Mayor, are you here? I am. Just Wonderful. took a minute to find my little icons. Welcome. Thank you. I'm really pleased to be here. Never thought I'd say that. But Senator Breen, Representative Purse, Representative Terry, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Appropriations and Financial Affairs and members of the Taxation Committee as well. 
My name is Anne Marie Mastracchio and I am the mayor of the city of Sanford. I'm here today on behalf of the Mayor's Coalition to testify on LD 221, the biennial budget, and discuss the critical role revenue sharing plays in our service to the people of Maine. The Mayor's Coalition is a nonpartisan group formed in 2012 and currently includes the mayors of nine Maine communities, Augusta, Biddeford, Lewiston, Portland, Rockland, Saco, Sanford, South Portland, and Westbrook, with a combined population of nearly 250,000. The coalition advocates for state and federal policies that recognize the important role that Maine cities play in providing vital services to Maine people across our state and the positive impact Maine cities have on the economic strength of our state. The coalition seeks to work in partnership with Maine state and federal elected officials to meet the needs of Maine people. We are submitting testimony to emphasize the importance of revenue sharing as you craft the biennial budget. Revenue sharing is an important partnership between the state and municipalities that recognizes that Maine towns and cities provide essential services to Maine people, local communities, and our economy, including roads, water, sewer, police, fire, and ambulance protection, to name just a few. This funding is critical to maintaining these services and helping to reduce the burden on property taxes within our communities. We greatly appreciate the steps the Mills administration and the legislature took over the last two years to incrementally increase revenue sharing to 3.75%. However, municipalities across the state are now experiencing a shortfall of over $20 million in revenue sharing. While we recognize the strain on state resources, we are experiencing the same strain on our budgets. As you work through this budget and future budgets, we strongly urge the committee to continue increasing revenue sharing funding until the mandated 5% threshold is met. And thank you for your time and consideration. I'd ha be happy to answer any questions that I'm able to answer. It's really thank nice to see a lot of my old friends. It's nice to see you and have you back. Uh, looks like Representative Purse has a question for you. I, I really just wanted to say hello and I'm glad that you came to testify. Congratulations on your new role and uh, continuing to advocate for all the municipalities around the state. So thanks, thanks for being here. Person. Thank you. I'm looking forward to being able to testify in person soon. Representative Terry and then Matt Lack. Thank you very much. And I also just wanted to mostly say <laughs> hello to Mayor Mastracchio and tell her that we miss her. Um, but I do have a question if you can um, tell me a little bit about the, uh, what the shortfalls have done for your community um, in the past year. Um, and um, uh, how important it is that revenue sharing, uh, uh, what the important role is that it takes in, in helping you guys get back on your feet. Well, the important thing to remember about revenue sharing is that we share in the good times and we share in the bad times. Mm -hmm. And when, the, when they decided 15 plus years ago to, to try to uh, balance a budget, by just reducing the amount of revenue sharing that we got, that was correlated exactly with what we had to raise taxes to continue the services that we provide. So it's a lot easier to um, break something down or take it away than it is to ever put it back. So to tell you the truth, I, I just can't tell you, that we have taxpayers that are overburdened it's, it's no different than when you when the state legislature passes a law but doesn't provide the funding for it. I mean, I, I always have said, you know, maybe we wouldn't need all these homestead ex exemptions and all this property tax relief if revenue sharing was at 5%. And then maybe if we did, it would be very targeted to people over 75. So the, I've all, I have, it's, I'm not saying anything different than I said in the last eight years in the legislature having served as a school board member and as a, as a town counselor before I served in the legislature, we felt that change and there was nothing we could do about it. Uh, Representative Matlack. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome back, Anne-Marie. Um, nice one of the things I remember from many years ago working for the city of Rockland was that the disproportionate tax burden fund was supposed to be an emphasis on service sector communities such as Sanford, Rockland, Portland, Lewiston, all the all the um, the the uh, mayor mayoral co coalition members. Um, 
probably it's not a question for you, but perhaps a question for those with the figures. Um, I seem to recall that the disproportionate tax burden fund has everybody except for maybe 10 communities as receiving funding, whereas it should be an emphasis on those municipalities that need extra help. And I was wondering whether or not the threshold for inclusion in this fund is a place to talk about increasing the funding for service sector communities and having uh, an impact in that direction. Can I respond to that? Sure. Because we get money from that, but I'm gonna just say it right up front. We store 5% funding for revenue sharing. We'll share in the good times and the bads. We can adjust our budgets accordingly. And um, you don't need all that other stuff then. I, that's really how I feel. Thank you. It's like you keep putting Band-Aids on things to fix the one problem that, you, that was started, not by all of you, but a lot of another legislature decided we're gonna balance the budget and we're just gonna reduce revenue sharing. This is what happens. Any other um, questions for Mayor Mastracchio? All right, thank you so much. It's great to thank see you. you. So um, next we have um, one of our colleagues, um, Representative Harnett. I'm gonna move him into the panelist. Um, Great, so Representative Harnett, give us a shout when you have arrived. I have arrived. Thank you and welcome. Thank you and good morning, Senator Breen, Representative Peirce, Representative Terry and members of the Appropriation and Financial Affairs Committee and the Taxation Committee. My name is Tom Harnett and I represent House District 83, which is Gardner and Farmingdale. I'm here today to discuss funding for municipal revenue sharing. Before joining the legislature in 2018, I served as the mayor of Gardner for six years and as a city councilor before that. I've consistently advocated for municipal revenue sharing at the long agreed to amount set in statute of 5%. Today, I'm here to speak for my constituents and municipalities throughout Maine. Moving forward, I hope to speak for a nonpartisan municipal caucus that will include state senators and members of the house. As mayor, I saw the devastating impacts that underfunding of revenue sharing had on our communities, our property taxpayers, the services we can provide to our friends, neighbors, our municipal employees, our local economies, our schools and public safety. What I saw and continue to see is not pretty. I've included an overview of statewide numbers regarding recent funding history and detailed numbers for Gardner and Farmingdale. The losses are substantial and that loss of revenue must be made up elsewhere. Municipalities are drowning in red ink. The decrease in revenue sharing has taken hundreds of millions of dollars away from local economies. The impact has been exacerbated by the amount of disposable income used to pay those property taxes and COVID-19 has made matters worse. As is always the case, the numbers do not tell the entire story. As mayor, I saw too many residents, friends and neighbors come before city council and tell us what the ever increasing property taxes they are paying are having on their lives. I sat in too many executive sessions where those residents, friends and neighbors came asking for property tax abatements because they couldn't pay their bill. They talked about the choice of having to fill a grocery cart, fill a prescription, fill an oil tank or pay their taxes. When they came before us, they were embarrassed and humiliated for having to share these personal details in a public way. They were afraid they were going to lose their homes, homes that had been in their families for decades, for generations. These folks had paid their property taxes in full in a timely manner for years, only to have the rules changed upon them, imposed upon them, and they feared losing their homes and dreams. We must do better. When municipal leaders craft budgets in, with dwindling revenue sharing, they have three choices, raise property taxes, cut services, or use revenue uh, fund balances. We had to do all three, and that is not sustainable. I acknowledge that we made great progress in the 129th by increasing revenue sharing from 2% to 3% 
to 3.75%. In the face of this pandemic, when so many property taxpayers are struggling with job loss, reduced income, and other challenges, now is not the time to continue to break our promise of full revenue sharing at 5%. Our friends, neighbors, small businesses, and their communities are struggling like never before. Now more than ever is the time to do what we all know is right, fully fund revenue sharing. I am here today asking you to restore revenue sharing to the statutorily required level of 5%. The impact of the historic reduction of that amount for over a decade by as much as 60% has been nothing short of devastating. The future of Maine's municipalities and their residents throughout Maine, if these funds are not restored, is very bleak. I thank you for your time and attention, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have today. Thank you, Representative Harnett. Any questions from either committee for Representative Harnett? Uh, looks like Senator Pouliot. Thanks, I have a question. Um, thank you, Representative Farnett. Uh, my question really is about um, the homestead exemption and, and as it relates to revenue sharing. Um, from a policy perspective, if we're, if we're trying to make sure that there's relief for property taxpayers, I wonder what your thoughts are on us you know, increasing the reimbursement from the state and using the, the resources that we have to reduce the burden on the municipality for that portion of what of homestead exemption for which they're responsible for um, instead of revenue sharing. And my, my thought behind that is just that that would, you know, be something that would directly be going toward property tax relief versus into a larger bucket of, of dollars, you know, that may or may not result in uh, property tax relief. Uh, thank you for the, the question, Senator. Uh, the homestead exemption can sometimes be a Trojan horse. Uh, it provides relief to the individual property taxpayer, but often does not reimburse the municipality for the cost of that reduction. Uh, so while it seemingly benefits the property taxpayer, it doesn't always help the municipal budget. Having been on city council, for seven years in Gardner, I trust the city council to spend money wisely. Um, I don't want to see the homestead exemption as a way to bypass the decisions that need to be made by the local community in determining their municipal budgets. I appreciate the homestead exemption. If it's not funded at 100% by the state, it does not provide the type of relief that municipalities need. Um, and I, th I think as Mayor Mastracchio said, if we fully fund revenue sharing at the 5% that was agreed to, we might not meet, need those Band-Aid fixes of uh, the homestead exemption. I hope that addresses your question. And if it doesn't, please let me know, sir. Yeah, Madam Chair, if I may. My yes, meeting. go ahead. Oh, thanks. <laughs> the joys of Zoom meetings. Um, I think you hit on it at the tail end there, Representative Harnett, which is when, I mean, this is constantly weighing different decisions. We're not at 100% reimbursement for homestead exemption. It's my position has been and to, that we should be at 100%. If we have X number of dollars to spend, should we since Homestead's on the books and it's a requirement ongoing for municipalities to cover a part of that right now, should we be focusing our efforts on getting to 100%, which is something that, you know, I think uh, would, would, would help municipalities in terms of reducing, you know, what they're having to cover, or should we be leaving it at the reimbursement rate right now, which I can't remember what it is, 60, 70, 70% or something like that. Um, and then increasing revenue sharing, if we, if we had to choose between the two? That, that's a good question and, and a hard question for me to answer. I think for the homestead exemption to be effective, it has to be funded at 100%. I agree with you 100%, 100% on that point. But I also think that we need the 5% revenue sharing. There was a reason the legislature 
determined that they would make a promise that municipalities would turn over income and sales tax to the state and the state would return 5% of that back to those municipalities. I can't see it as an either or situation. Um, I think that the municipal governments need to have the flexibility and the finances to craft responsible budgets that meet the needs of their residents and small businesses and large businesses. Uh, but if the state does choose to use the homestead exemption to provide more direct property tax relief, it has to be at 100%. Otherwise, the municipality needs to make it else, up elsewhere. Thank you, Representative Harnett and Senator Pouliot. Um, any other questions for Representative Harnett? Not seeing any at this moment. So uh, thank you very much, Representative Harnett. We will let you go and wish you a good weekend. Um, looks like my co-chair is, uh, no, just waving. All right. I was waving goodbye to Representative Harnett. Very nice. <laughs> as I moved him out. <laughs> um, so next we have um, Kate DeFore and uh, from Maine Municipal, and then we're gonna have Sarah Austin, James Gardner, and George LaPointe. So first we will have um, Kate DeFore. I will move you over to panelists and just give us a little sh hello shout when you arrive. I see your name in a square. That's a good sign. There you are. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Breen and representatives um, Purse and Terry and members of the Appropriations and Taxation Committees. My name is Kate Dufour and I'm here on behalf of the Maine Municipal Association to provide testimony in support of uh, several of the provisions of this section of the budget, uh, but primarily um, the, um, the, the revenue sharing funding at 3.75% in both the first and second year of this biennial budget. Uh, this is incredibly important to us um, as is your continued journey on the path to 5%. Um, so I'm here to thank you and the governor and I ask and urge you to move us forward down the line. Uh, my role today is more of a background singer uh, and there are some members behind me that will come and present the association's uh, position as well as my city mayor is here today to, um, to opine on the, the importance of the revenue sharing program. But I do want to let you know that I am available uh, should you have questions, and I look forward to working with all of you in uh, subsequent work sessions and can answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Ms. DeFour. Any questions for Ms. DeFour um, from any of our legislators? I am not seeing any. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Thank you for joining us. So next we will have um, Sarah Austin and then James Gardner and then George LaPointe. I hope I said that in the right order, but for sure we have uh, Sarah Austin coming now. Oh, it looks like George LaPointe joined us. Maybe I did that wrong. Pardon me. There's Sarah. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's always amazing when that works out. So <laughs> Still getting used to this, but um, good morning. Um, Senators Breen and Representative Person Terry and members of the Appropriation and Taxation Committees. My name is Sarah Austin and I'm a policy analyst at the Maine Center for Economic Policy. I am here to testify on Part G of the proposed budget revenue sharing. Um, this program requires the state to distribute 5% of state sales and income tax revenues to towns and cities. 
And this funding, as I'm sure you're from a lot of testifiers today, supports local services like libraries, parks, public safety, and road maintenance, while reducing pressure on property taxes. In nearly every budget for almost three and a half decades, the state made good on this commitment to our communities. But in 2009, the legislature slashed revenue sharing to balance the budget. Um, funding was cut again and again in subsequent years, leaving communities to raise mill rates, cut local services, or both. In the last 10 years, um, 2019 and back for 10 years, lawmakers have cut $700 million out of revenue sharing program in total. Um, while previous cuts to revenue sharing were scheduled to expire this year, Part G of the budget um, would extend these cuts for another two years to keep it at 3.75% reimbursement rate. Part G shortchanges mean communities by about $90 million over the two year budget period, um, uh, committing only 3.75% instead of the 5%. In 2011, 2015, and 2017, income tax breaks that disproportionately benefited the highest income households cut into state revenues and revenue sharing, along with education funding, um, paid the price for those tax cuts. So the inability to balance the budget and revenue sharing cuts has been a trend that has also accompanied cuts to the revenues that actually make the funding these programs possible. Right now, Maine's income tax code is raising about $430 million less per year compared to the income tax code we had in place in 2010. Additionally, in 2017, legislators repealed another um, tax source that would have raised taxes on the top 2% and raised about $160 million a year um, that would have helped fund school funding. So while this budget that you all are looking at does not propose any new income tax cuts, it embraces the tax structure that has come over the past decade or so that has restricted the amount of funds that we have to invest in things like revenue sharing and education. Municipal revenue sharing is important. It supports jobs in our local com communities and every cent that our towns and cities are denied because of this inadequate tax policy increases the risk that our teachers, our first responders and other middle-class workers will lose their jobs. This dynamic is not theoretical. Um, local government saw a drop in revenues over the summer as a result of the pandemic. And by December of 2020, we can see in um, data that local governments are employing about 400 and excuse me, 4,400 fewer people than in December of 2019. In an already weakened labor force, it is essential that the legislature is invested in protecting jobs, especially local jobs um, that we know do important services for our communities. So without a plan to raise revenues, our communities are going to continue to lag cash strapped for the foreseeable future. And we urge the committees to reject this proposal on revenue sharing and seek fair and sustainable revenue to restore our commitment to funding states, um, communities through municipal revenue sharing and other programs as well. Um, so with that, I will take any questions and really thank you all for your time this morning. Thank you, Ms. Austin. Any questions from either committee for Ms. Austin? If you wouldn't mind um, doing the raise hand function, that's easier for me to see on two screens. Not seeing anyone. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good um, to see you. And now I'm gonna bring um, James Gardner over and then, um, then we will have um, George LaPointe. So why isn't James, oh, there we go. Okay, sorry, that's not James, that's me. Uh, I see his square. But don't I see the picture, are you there? I see Madam Chair. Uh, we do not see you. Do you wanna, do you have a video you'd like to show or is it just your voice? How about? Oh, there you that? are. Thank you, welcome. No, no, thank you as I navigate through the worlds of technology here. Uh, again, Madam, Madam Chair, thank you. 
Senators Bream, Representatives Purse and Terry, and members of the Appropriation and Taxation Committees. My name is James Gardner, Jr. I am the town manager in Easton and the president of the Maine Municipal Association. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in favor of the revenue sharing provisions found in Part G of LD221 on behalf of the Maine Municipal Association. Revenue sharing is an important source of funding for municipal governments. Not only does the program reduce the burdens placed on property taxpayers, the sharing of these state revenues recognizes in part the pressures unfunded and partially funded mandates place on communities. But most importantly, the program reinforces the state municipal partnership. During the last 11 months, under the stress of, of the pandemic the impacted communities across the state, the strength of that relationship was put to test. Municipal leaders rose to the challenge with guidance provided by state agencies, municipal officials efficiently conducted state and secured town meetings, elections, and adopted budgets necessary to seamlessly provide needed municipal services. Our local law enforcement, code enforcement, and health officers were the eyes and ears for the state. We implemented programs to educate residents, businesses, and guests about the safety provisions in place. We also opened up our parks and recreational programs to help parents deal with childcare. To this day, municipal officials remain open to helping the state in every way possible. In return, members of the Governor Mills administration provided us with the tools, guidance, and revenues necessary to accomplish those tasks. Furthermore, municipal officials believe Governor Mills' proposal to keep the amount of state sales and income tax revenue shared with municipalities at 3.75% is validation of the strength state municipal partnership. Taking into consideration that the state is facing its own funding shortfalls and challenges, municipal officials commend the governor for not taking the easy way out. This budget does not repeat history by using revenue sharing dollars to fill state funding gaps, for which we are grateful. For this reason, excuse me, however, we need to continue to make progress on the path towards 5%. For this reason, on behalf of MMA and its 484 member communities, I urge the members of the Appropriations and Taxation Committees to find avenues for increasing the amount of sales tax and income tax revenue shared with communities this year and next. While municipal leaders understand that federal revenue may be distributed to states and municipalities in the near future, that aid will help communities, businesses, residents and families begin to heal from the fiscal and physical stresses associated with the pandemic. Setting a clear path towards 5% will help municipalities sustain programs and the delivery of mandated and desired services well into the future. In closing, I want to thank you for your time and consideration of the municipal perspective on this issue. I also want to point to the materials attached to this testimony. The first is a copy of a COVID financial impacts report that was shared with the Appropriations Committee last August. The second document provides a history of the revenue sharing program. Finally, the third is a copy of MMA's 2021 Physical Issues paper, which spotlights the municipality's response to the ongoing public health crisis. In that paper, you will read examples of how municipal, municipal leaders from seven towns and cities stepped up to the challenge to protect their communities. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact Kate Dufort at kdufort at memu and n at org or 1-800-452-8786. Kate will be available to you at your work sessions should you need more information. With that end, I will take any questions that the committees have.
Thank you very much, Mr. Gardner. We really appreciate you joining us. Any questions from either committee for um, Mr. Gardner? I am not seeing any. So um, thank you again. Really appreciate okay. it. Thank you, Madam Chair. And now we are going to welcome um, George LaPointe. And he will be moving over to the panelist section. There he is. Welcome. You are on mute, however. I am on mute. Can you, you hear me now? I apologize. Um, I think I accidentally just muted you. I apologize. Can you take yours off again? Great. And how do I sign now? We're in business. Thank Great. you. Thank you. And, <laughs> and you would think uh, I do many, many uh, Zoom meetings and you would think it would be old hat by now, but it every cir circumstance is different. <clears throat> um, Senator Breen, uh, Representative Terry, and Representative Person, members of the committee, I am George LaPointe. I'm the mayor of Hollowell. I've been the mayor two months, so I have less experience than other people before me, uh, but I've been on city council for a while. And I'm testifying today in favor of the provisions in LD 221 with respect to revenue sharing and the homestead exemption uh, line items. Hollowell is a city of about 2,350 people and six square miles just south of Augusta. Our municipal budget is about $6.5 million. Much of our municipal budget is driven by issues beyond our control, such as the RSU2 budget, which takes up almost exactly half of Hollowell's municipal budget. County taxes make up another 4.2%, uh, and this leaves with the, the city with about 46.5% of our budget to pay for police, fire, public works, and other functions needed to maintain our city. With this backdrop, the budget levels for municipal revenue sharing and homestead exemption reimbursement are critical to maintaining Hollowell's ability to fund ongoing operations and pay attention to long-term capital expenditure needs. Every year, similar to the other uh, municipal folks you have heard, we struggle to maintain core city functions and investments because of budget issues beyond our control. Uh, and simply put, the uh, increases in these two budget line items helps the city of Hollowell and other municipalities and any decreases will hurt our ability to meet ongoing city needs. Specifically, I support the provisions of LD 221 that maintain municipal revenue sharing at 3.75% for the next two fiscal years. Municipal revenue sharing makes or breaks our municipal budget because we have so many fixed costs for essential services and functions. In Hollowell's case, this would include more emphasis on roads and sidewalks, replacing our aging public works facility, which sits in the Kennebec River flood zone and modernizing our police department. If possible, and as mentioned by other speakers, uh, raising municipal share revenue sharing beyond the proposed 3.75% would help provide Hollowell and other municipalities the ability to direct funding to critical local needs, just as uh, such as those I've mentioned. I also support provisions of the the, the bill's provisions <clears throat> to allocate roughly $97 million in both fiscal years of the biennium to continue to reimburse municipalities for 70% of the lost property tax revenue associated with the homestead exemption program. For Hollowell, this would mean um, approximately $175,000 annually, which similar to revenue sharing helps Hollowell uh, greatly in its annual budgeting process in meeting the needs of our diverse citizenry. Although not directly related to LD 221, legislative efforts to approach or reach the state paying 55% of state budgets would also greatly help Hollowell in providing essential uh, public services, inv investing in our infrastructure needs and keeping our property tax rate as low as possible. Although my testimony is relatively short, the impacts of the proposed budget from these two programs are very significant to Hollowell, as well as other <clears throat> main towns and cities. I urge your acceptance of the revenue sharing and homestead exemption budget provisions as proposed in LD 221. And I would be happy to answer any questions that people have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor LaPointe. We're really glad you could join us. Um, and are there any questions for Mayor LaPointe 
from any of the committee members. Not seeing any. So um, thank you for coming and, and for submitting your testimony. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for your time today. Take care. Thank you. Um, I just want to check in with our clerk, um, Mandy, would you mind coming on for a second so we can just um, make sure. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, sorry, Mandy, um, is, is that it for the public um, testimony? That's all I have. Okay. Um, so I think that concludes our public hearing. Um, so uh, Representative Terry has her hand up. Sorry, actually, uh, if you wanna discuss with Mandy first what you need to, um, I have something re in regards to her as well. So you go right ahead. I was actually just checking to see if we had any more folks to testify, but um, oh, okay. it, doesn't, it doesn't look like we do. So go ahead. All right, great. Uh, so I just wanted to um, mention to specifically our tax committee members, um, we don't get the testimony from AFA um, sent to our email boxes like we do with our tax testimony. So I just want to encourage all of our tax members to go on to the AFA website. Um, and uh, there's 56 items currently testimony. I'm sure there will be more. Um, so uh, if just to make sure that we all have, uh, you know, written word in front of us while we're thinking about what we need to do. Um, that's it. Looks like our analyst is joining us. Maureen? Hello. Uh, we uh, do not post the testimony on the AFA website. It eventually gets posted under the LD, but I will and have uh, in the first part, I sent all the testimony that AFA got to the analyst, and I'll do that again. I'll, I'll send it to Julie, who can then forward it to you. It, it will eventually be posted online, but it, there is a lag, and I don't want you to have to deal with that lag. So that's how you are likely to get this testimony. Awesome. Thanks very much, Maureen. I appreciate it. Maureen, I think we are uh, all finished with our business today. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I believe that is, Madam Chair. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I want to thank our um, colleagues from the Tax Committee uh, for joining us. And um, I will ask those folks um, to stay, uh, to go on their way and um, have a good weekend. And I'll ask the Appropriations Committee folks just to stand by for a few minutes for some business. Um, and I will, this, this public hearing is adjourned. Madam Chair, Madam Chair. Yes. Before tax leaves, I just wanna remind them that their report back is due on Wednesday, the 24th of March. Fantastic. Thank you. We'll be, uh, we'll be talking about it on Thursday. So hopefully we'll have it for you prior to that. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Have a great weekend.